Hello and welcome virtually to the chapel of Queen's College, Cambridge. It's a delight uh, to be able to have you with us in some way uh, this evening before we have a reflection on the life and witness of John Wycliffe, who's in the window above me just there. We'll be having some organ music from our fabulous organ scholar, Ben. It's a time to reflect and to take stock of the situation we're all in and perhaps to find in that silence some comfort and some peace. John Wycliffe was no saint. In my experience, people use this as a euphemism, often at funerals, when someone has a complicated past. However, in this case, it couldn't be plainer. John Wycliffe was not a saint. In fact, he was a heretic. He spent his life in moderate to great comfort, and unlike Fisher, about whom we heard last week, Wycliffe did all he could to cozy up to the secular powers of the day. And when he was finally condemned, he ended his life in a fairly comfortable house arrest before being dug up 40 years after his death to have his bones burned because posthumous retribution was very on trend. The clergyman and scholar had nothing to do with Cambridge, but he had some sort of sketchy affiliation with another Queen's College in another university. I suppose if he belongs anywhere in our cast of characters here in chapel, it's shoehorned in this window with some other late medieval reformers of the church. This is because well after his death, he was appropriated as a poster boy by Protestant reformers and became known as the morning star of the Reformation. Wycliffe's image, like the others in Kemp's glass, is full of clues as to who he was. He's pictured with a translation of the Bible wearing the scarlet robes of a doctor over the black robes of a scholar and priest, and beneath all of this at the very base, rather than the shoes which we see on the feet of his colleagues, he has open-toed sandals. As Wycliffe translated the Bible into English, these mostly bare feet could be a reference to the prophet Isaiah, who wrote how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, but it could also signify the poverty 
which Wycliffe advocated the church to take upon herself. When Wycliffe started to dabble in politics, his hobby horse was ecclesiastical disendowment, which translated into English means that he thought the church should give away all of its cash to the crown. The problem was he absolutely did not seem to practice what he preached, when he resigned from being master of Balliol, it was to take up the college's wealthiest living in the countryside. Of course, the Crown loved this because they were busy fighting a century-long war with France and a clerical cash could buy rather a lot of longbows. He also advised the Crown that they could withhold papal taxes and use the money for their war chest. But at the same time, he was painfully aware that more should be done to alleviate the plight of the poor and believed in a vast redistribution of wealth. Sir Anthony Kenny, a former master of Balliol, described Wycliffe as one of only two communist masters Balliol had ever seen. His was also the first celebrity objection to the doctrine of transubstantiation, and it was this, along with his political treaties, which were seen to support the peasants' revolt, which caused his writings to be banned and he got locked up in his vicarage in Lutterworth, where he died two years later. So, Wycliffe was a fairly well-off clerical academic who decried the wealth and power of the church while promoting the wealth and power of his secular patron, John and Gaunt, who was, quite frankly, a nasty piece of work. His rigorous intellect led him to reject one or some fundamental church doctrines but at the same time, he never quite stuck his neck out. So was he a hypocrite? Interestingly, it's generally received that he was a pious and earnest man, and it was actually his uncalculating manner, not deviousness, which saw him fall. So what good is that as an example to us today? The gospel and life of Jesus Christ is riddled with deeply uncomfortable challenges and sayings, and one such is this. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves, which Christ told his disciples before they went out to preach the good news. And this isn't an invitation to dishonesty, but rather a warning. Wycliffe serves not so much as an example which we wish to follow, but more as one which we may wish to avoid. A warning against naivety. He was intellectually brilliant, but not worldly so. His head was in the clouds, but his feet were absolutely not on the ground. If he were canonized today, he might become the patron saint of misappropriation or unintended consequences. He was taken advantage of and his honest convictions were almost certainly manipulated by those in power for their own political and selfish ends. Then, long after his death, reformers of all shapes and sizes once again appropriated him and claimed him as their own champion. So, the warning from Wycliffe is to look out. You may have good intentions, but there are those who will try to take what you have and corrupt it for their own selfish ends without a thought for you. What you can offer the world has extraordinary potential, but make sure to guard it carefully and be wise as a serpent, but innocent as a dove. Let us pray. O God, who knowest us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers, that by reason of the frailty of our nature we cannot always stand upright, grant us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.